I think we should join the League of Shadows. <laughs> That's what I'm just saying. <laughs> if they're working on it. The only people person who's really stopping them is Batman. So the way I see it now, Batman might be racist. Hi, I'm Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Champs. And I am Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. This season, we're getting whelmed for DC's greatest sidekicks and covering every episode of Young Justice on... Yeah, another DC animated podcast, part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Welcome to yet another episode of yet another DC animated podcast. My name is Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I am Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. Andrew and I have known each other since 1996. That was the year. Robin of Loxley, the TV movie, was released. In this movie, Robin uh, wins the lottery, goes to Loxley Academy, and needs to steal from the rich to help one of his friends who was hurt and need money for an operation. And this involves fighting the FBI agent Walter Nottingham and taking down the richest kids in the school to stop him. Does he use a bow and arrow? I have no idea. Uh, but there is one on the, the cover of the DVD that features the voice of Beth from Rick and Morty. Wow. Sarah Chalk. Well, you know. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, Robin was played by Devin Sawa, uh, which you might know from Final Destination, um, Idle Hands, Casper, and Chucky, the current sci fi horror series. The hell? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, oh, I'm just trying to, I just need to know, was this a DCOM? Was it a Nickelodeon? Who produced this? This the, the more you talked about the story, the more I was just like, this has to be on some cable network. A uh, Hallmark. <laughs> Hall wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, so I guess this is back in the day where Hallmark, Hallmark wasn't just, uh, just Christmas movies all the time. <laughs> they took a break from the holidays for one time. I feel like they should stick to the holidays after hearing that description. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we are talking about um, Robin Hoods and bows and arrows and the fastest shooters in the West, by which we mean using bows and arrows. Um, you know, I personally think Legolas might be the best, but, you know, we can mm. talk about that. Uh, but today we're talking about that because we're talking about our character in this set of arc for the Young Justice Phantoms season four. Again, uh, Young Justice Phantoms is going through all the members of the original team to show us where they are just about 10 years later or so since we first met them back in season one. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on the next person in the arc after everything that's happened with McGann and R.I.P. Superboy. We're now going to be talking about Artemis Croc, uh, the only superhero who decided to go for first name as her actual code name. <laughs> Strangely, it is addressed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're covering episodes four, sorry, five through eight, as we were talking about uh, Tale of Two Sisters, Artemis Through the Looking Glass, The Lady or the Tigress, and I Know Why the Caged Cat Sings. Um, this is a fun little thing that they decided to do with this one because in the story, the series, Artemis does become a comparative lit professor, so it's nice to kind of see that the titles of the episodes kind of connect to the stories that I guess one could compare in a comparative lit class. <laughs> Take notes. <laughs> uh, so we got animation production done by Studio Mer. Um, timing of this episode takes place between March 26th to April 22nd. Uh, and we're just going to call this one Artemis, as again, we're just going through the arcs of the individuals. Um, so speaking of Artemis herself, we do have our cast list here where we have Stephanie Lamellon, um, who is voicing Artemis as well as the computer system of the Justice League and the team and the Zeta tube and all that. Uh, Zara Fazal, who does have a brief scene as Halo once again. However, she is now Cassandra Savage, Ma Kent and Leanne. Oh, OK. Ma Kent was not the one I was expecting. Same, but I was just <laughs> All right, I'm going to be honest with y'all. When I was listening to Ma Kent, I was just like, yo, she sounded a little, like, she got some, that she's not all white. <laughs> That's all I was going to say. <laughs> she, did say, she did say she was making chicken, you know. That right. That's so what cool. I was just like, she said it nice. <laughs> it was like, is Superman 
the Superman raised by a black family? Because that is he so it. strong? Because he's been eating seasoned chicken his whole life. <laughs> oh man, but Ma Kent, you're a real one. Um, we got next up, Allison Stoner is Oracle, aka Batgirl, aka Barbara Gordon. Uh, Gwendolyn Yao is Lady Shiva or Rictus. This was a fun little thing I didn't realize. <laughs> like, was not expecting Rictus on this list. <laughs> No one ever expects Rictus. Oh gosh, is this is this our new t- um, Tusk? Is this our new <laughs> Carmen? <Dillo? laughs> Whoa, man! T- you gotta you gotta train for a few more years before you're a Tusk level. <laughs> uh, next up, Kelly Hugh is returning as Cheshire, aka Jade, and she's also voicing the mother of Jade and Artemis Paula Croc. Uh, Crispin Freeman gives voice to two members of the Roy gang here, as he is Will and Roy Harper. Um, if you are like me or a bunch of other people right now, you are probably having a great time playing as Black Spider. Um, but Josh Keaton was the one that had the role <laughs> this entire time. <laughs> uh, so that menace is swinging through this <laughs> through this episode once again. Uh, Nick Chundlin is returning as our favorite Crusher Sportsmaster Croc, which now that I realize what his first name is, I'm I'm shocked that wasn't his code name. <laughs> You know what? He too easy for him. Easy. And he's also trying not to get busted by the authorities. <laughs> Boy, you gotta protect that rep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we have we're introducing a newcomer here. Uh Onyx is joining this set of episodes here. We've never seen her before. Uh she is voiced by someone who I believe this is her second voiceover role. Uh so she plays Sally in the live action Bratz movie. And also Sally in the video game that they made for the Bratz. Um, I, 2007 was a weird year, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, she is the person who took over the role of Samantha White um, in the Netflix continuation series with the same title as this film, Dear White People, as today we have Logan Browning voicing Onyx. Oh, okay. That's where I know her from. Yeah. I did have to take my sister to see the Bratz movie. Uh, is the Bratz movie where you knew her from? The Brat, it was yes. Bratz movie, not not dear white people, right? Uh, sure, I'm sure it was Bratz movie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now that our cast list is set, we know what episodes we're talking about. Let's take the tube over to the beginning of a tale of two sisters. We start out as all great arcs start out montage, <laughs> and we see that Artemis and Will are living their life. You know how it is; they're taking care of a kid. But we also see Artemis is a professor now. She even has a new love interest that isn't her brother-in-law. So things are looking pretty decent for Artemis at the moment. Um, but because this takes place after everything that happened on Mars, she arrives home and finds that the team, members of her team are waiting for her. And all she does is say, who? And they reveal that it is Connor. Uh, this sparks a another take on the montage where now she's too distracted to enjoy breakfast with um, Leanne. She's not teaching well, and in before she was doing well in battle, but now she isn't. And this prompted me to say, "Girl, can you not take a day off? <laughs> like <laughs> one day? <laughs> Come on, man! Like give yourself a day." <laughs> where she was teaching again the tale of two cities and it started with legit the opening line and i feel like everybody knows the opening line she forgot it and that's just like at that point girl take take the day mental health is yeah. important you're a college professor these students will understand <laughs> after she's going through all of this we do see some sweet moments that happen where will does decide to hang up a picture of the original team on the wall so this is like the first time um, we get a chance to see that they're building their home around this fact that they have these strong connections. We'll say it was a little weird, though, that you have the full picture. So if anybody walks in, they're like, holy crap, you know, Miss Martian and Superboy. Like, I feel like that's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. Um, but as they are, as she's like going through and having these conversations, um, she starts having this one conversation with her mom. And she's talking about the fact that she has some regrets. Um, There's like some people that she's reached out to that she's done so much good work on trying to get them out there. As we know in the past, we're talking about like Tara 
and a couple other individuals. But there is one person who she feels that she has failed this entire time has never done right by them. I don't know why her mother thought it was Wally. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? Read the room, mom. Facts. <laughs> like it was your other daughter, Mrs. Croc. <laughs> the one y'all all failed. From. I mean, that's too much. That's too much. But, <laughs> <laughs> but she decides that it's time for her to make do on the long thing she's forgotten to do and just trying to get Jade to come back home to be with her daughter um, but it looks like Jade is living her best life because Cheshire is on the speedboat racing to Infinity Island. Yes, and uh, once she arrives there, uh, she tries to fight Iroh. I mean, <laughs> Sensei, Sensei. Uh, <laughs> looks nothing like General Iroh from Last Night Bernard at all. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> basically, Sensei is like, bro, why, why are you here? Like, Sensei is ready to beat her down and even kill her if necessary. But he, at the moment, is just not even interested in doing much. Um, In between this, we do get a flashback to uh, Jade and Artemis's Cobra Kai training, where they were not taught to have any mercy whatsoever. Um, But that flashback... It's always strike first. (laughs) It's always strike first. (laughs) <laughs> Check hard, no mercy. <laughs> so we give a little bit of background. We cut back to the present time where now we see Artemis is being watched. Uh, we see that um, some mysterious person is following. And as um, somebody, our friend Ocean Master, has <laughs> reminded us, uh, if you try to follow one of the Justice League or team, it's over for you. And... <laughs> That person learns quickly because instead of Artemis confronting the the follower, Arsenal <laughs> and Arrowette come to fight her, and the results are pretty predictable. Yeah, they uh take this person down real quick. I think my my favorite moment out of this was we got to see how hood Artemis actually could be because she rolled up on her and said, "So you came to my home, my home," and. Apparently there is a there's like a safe ground was like uh I forget what the term is actually, but as long as the, the heroes know that they can't just roll up on the villain's home and the same goes for them. So they were like she's basically saying, because you came to my home and followed me there since then, I have every power right now to just end you. Um, but luckily this person who introduces herself as Onyx does share that. She has some news that is mostly that's going to be helpful for them because she shares that she is uh, part of the League of Shadows. And she also shares that she defected from the League of Shadows because somebody is on their way to try to take them out and probably serve as like a mole on their team. So she wanted to get the jump on them because she was tired of always following along with the League of Shadows. And while everyone's questioning, like, do we actually believe her? Come on, this is the same plot line from, like, honestly, like, two seasons now. Like, half our show is about moles. <laughs> like, this is Especially when... since Arsenal's there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this is when we do see the potential for a mole as Cassandra Savage walks through. And she's looking quite different from when we last saw her during that episode where we learned a little bit about Vandal Savage's history. Uh, We could basically say that at this point, she no longer has a hand on the situation that she has in life. Oh, yes. Cassandra is now blinded in one eye and missing an arm Star Wars style. So where she is here to make a compelling case about that she has defected from the League of Shadows. And of course, Onyx and Cassandra call each other moles and for her defense cassandra does a call back she says oh, the death of olympia from previous seasons her sis her older sister in more ways than one um broke her and she wanted to rebel against her father vandal and in retaliation he apparently cut her arm off though onyx is like no 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 you lost that on a mission with killer croc either or it sounds terrible but <laughs> but um, so now they're trying to decide who's the deceiver and who's not. Meanwhile, Sensei again is up to, to Cheshire and like, why are you here? Out of the shadows st- steps Talia, da- baby Damien and Red Hood, right? That's definitely Red Hood. 
Yeah, like <laughs> they keep crediting it as like Red Hood and Ninja, but let's be honest, this is Red Hood without having being able to tell that story. <laughs> this is this is just so it's annoying to a point where I'm just like, just just put up in the damn story already. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. He doesn't say much anyway. Yeah. <laughs> in a very, in a in a let's say creative exchange, Cheshire calls Talia out for raising her own son instead of discarding him interesting take uh-huh. um but talia is unfazed by cheshire's insults and sensei lets cheshire know you came here to die come back when you're here ready to live he also says this while she's running away so his voice is incredible it carries the acoustics on that island Woo! and uh now it's time for another flashback guys <laughs> yeah we get a chance to see um about 16 years ago when jay decided to leave home uh, Artemis is pleading with her sister, telling her that she needs to stay. At this point, again, just a little backstory on them. Um, Paula Croc, their mother, was the original tigress. And upon being caught during an accident, um, she was confined to a wheelchair while serving prison, prison time. And their father was the one that had to raise them. But of course, uh, because it's Crusher and you know he's got to protect his rep, he had to make sure that his daughters were just as formidable as he is. So he trained them all the time. And during this flashback, we see that Jade has had enough of it. Artemis is asking her to stay because the family is breaking apart. And she tells her that, you know, she can't be a part of this anymore. Um, and that the most important thing is that, like, she's just going to disappear like the Cheshire cat. Uh, she tells her sister, too, that she should leave. But... Artemis decides to stay because she doesn't really know what to do. And she most importantly, she decides to stay because she wants to wait for their mother to come out of prison. And that's when Jay decides to take off. And now Artemis is stuck having to be trained by Crusher Croc. While speaking of that training, though, it does come to a very well, like circle, very big full circle here, because that training does come into play when Tigris, Arouette, Arsenal, Will, as they're transporting Onyx and Cassandra to the vault. Um, the vault was back in season was introduced back in season two, where we first found out about Will and Roy, and after finding him, and Roy decided to go on his uh, vendetta against Lex by blowing up the vault. Somehow, it was rebuilt enough that it can serve as a place where the Justice League or the team can store criminals on t- and interrogate them until they figure out the situation i do do have to ask is this like green arrows kind of backup base or something i i do believe this is the the um as it is called in injustice the quiver uh this oh, yes. the quiver too because <laughs> just a disrespect about oh if he gets compromised no biggie that is literally the words from arsenal yeah. where where's the respect for green arrow in this universe jeez guys your mentor but on transit, both vehicles are attacked. They were transporting Cassandra and Onyx separately, but it doesn't matter. Both of them are attacked. And again, we have the the big, the biggest combo uh, you can expect from the show. Bow Hunter security had Will and a clipboard getting it done. And mm-hmm. it's a it's a wild battle. Um, Roy definitely kills some people. A hundred percent kills some people in the battle, even though they say they don't. I mean, you blow up a car, you're gonna kill people. And we do get a really tragic loss. Um, just after Superboy, we hit this tragic loss of the clipboard. That's right. Will's clipboard is is shattered. So I want everybody to pour one out. Mm-hmm. If you have a clipboard, you know, just make sure you tell it all your feelings because you could lose it at any moment like Will did. So with the tragic loss, Will is forced to switch to Penfu and just stabs a ninja in the back, which somehow... Hurts the ninja enough to to stop it. I I don't know what because bargain the bin. pen is mightier than the sword, Andrew. Oh God, it, that's I I didn't pay attention at the beginning of Tale of Two Cities and, <laughs> and not that fake phrase either. You're completely right. So, <laughs> as this battle rages on, Artemis gets into a little spot of danger. Yes, she unfortunately does get grabbed behind by one of the shadows. And in a surprising twist, she gets saved by Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is able to knock out the person who is trying to take down Artemis. 
And at the same time, Onyx is able to save Roy. And this is when Roy, after everybody has been put down, Roy asked the question, all y'all could have gotten out at any point. They both said, yep, pretty much. And the next question is, so y'all still think the other is the mole? Yep, pretty much. Uh, so now that means times to actually head on over to the vault and try to interrogate each woman in their rooms. Um, of course, Cassandra still claims that the shadows were after her for the betrayal. Honest claims that the attack was deployed to help Cassandra sell the story. And the rest of the team is just listening in on this. In fact, we also get a couple more individuals to join the room as Tara, Spoiler, and Orphan are all asking, are all watching as this happens. Um, Tara provides her feedback as a former shadow herself and saying that everything that they're doing is pretty much shadows protocol. So it's going to be hard to tell who's actually the mole. And Orphan is also a former shadow who doesn't speak. Um, she does do a psychic link up with one of this is Looker was here, right? Or is that Yeah, Looker, Looker, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh she does a psychic link up with one of the other uh meta humans on the team who was actually introduced back in season three during um uh she was one of the meta humans that was forced to fight when um Kid Flash unfortunately was hit and everybody was very concerned about <laughs> if he was actually okay. Uh, Looker joins the team and through her psychic ability, she shares that Orphan also tells them that there's no way to tell who's actually the mole because honestly, the best course of action is just to take them both out. Yeah, apparently they've been trained to thwart psychic interference. Uh, sure, League of Shadows. Sure. Still better than micro expressions. Uh, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> and after a confusing speech about Apple metaphors, um, we... <laughs> We get um we're left with the question of who's telling the truth, who is the liar. They also do a little hint if uh Cassandra Savage leaves, it would be a scandal, kind of a reference to her name, Scandal Savage, mm -hmm. in, in other mediums. So Artemis, through all of this, says, Look, everyone deserves a second chance at redemption. And we close on a flashback where after Jay looks leaves uh for Rio. Sportsmaster says, I'm not looking for her. She left. Whatever. Time to focus on you. No mercy. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's the first episode. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, we get it after that in our after credits. We get a quick reading from Artemis as she recites Charles Dickens' The Tales Two Cities. Uh, and then we immediately jump through the looking glass for Artemis through the looking glass as we see now that um, Jade is snuck back home. She finds Artemis with a broken arm and a black eye, and Artemis asks the question, why are you here? And it par parallels very well because Jade, in the future, has arrived at the Harper home under the impression, again, that, um, that Leanne was in trouble, and Jade asks Artemis the same question. Just cause It's a fun little interaction because Artemis does explain that of the situation, uh, but Jade also shares the only reason why she should ever be returning home it's because if Leanne needs a blood transfusion or her organ donation, because she is the only genetic, she's the only genetic match. Uh, I'm assuming because Will is a clone. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, same, same, yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't have. So I mean, it's still half of Artemis. So, oh, right, like, that's I, <laughs> trying to figure out. The thing that pushes her over the edge is the, the simple reveal that. Hey, the shadows came to my house. And if Onyx can find me and she's off the shadows, then anybody else can. And they can find your daughter. So you want to help resolve this or not? So at that, uh, she just Chester decides to help a little bit where she can. We cut back to Hollywood where we catch up with Beast Boy for the first time since Mars. And upon being invited on a mission that sounds absolutely wild and I would love to see. He says, you know what, I'm actually too, still tired from the, the javelin ride in space. I'm going to sleep. And his teammates know he's been sleeping a lot lately, uh, but they don't really have time. They got to go off to their mission. Um, and we got to find out who's this mole. And as, again, they've hit another wall, they can't figure out who the mole is. We get another flashback where, well... Artemis is trying to sneak out food. Sportsmaster says, no, not even a crumb for you. 
Uh, it, it is it's wild. This parenting is wild. Um, also realized that his actual name is not actually Crusher. It is a nickname. His real name is Lawrence. <laughs> oh, his his gang name. <laughs> his gang name is Crusher. <laughs> Um, but after they have this conversation, um, Jade says something that about being mad as Hatters, um, because that's the main reason why she wants to get out of this. It's apparently a code phrase that is given between Jade and Artemis to know where they should meet up. Uh, we do hop back in the future for another potential for another meeting. As Artemis is in the park, she's sitting on the bench. She shares that as she sees someone jogging up with a dog. And this person shares that basically the two of them are in a relationship together as they kiss. Because and in that moment, Jade calls them out for kissing in the middle of the in the middle of the night, um, because Jade is in, being introduced as Artemis' sister here. Yeah, and she grills him, and I get it mm -hmm. as an older sibling, the temptation to grill, but. Uh, upon finding out he's a detective, she goes, you're a private dick. And I was like, what is this hostility? <laughs> what rating are we? Because um, they go back and forth. And um, the dialogue here is just uh, really odd and bizarre. Mm -hmm. Artemis says hi to a dog at one point and saying, oh, I'm introducing my sister to this dog. And it's it's weird. But all you need to know is... uh. No, there's really nothing from the scene that you really need to know, so we can just move on. Um, <laughs> oh, I mean, there is one little thing that I really I found out about. Okay. Um, remember back in the uh, the episode, the the uh, the first season episode where they had the plan that where everything failed around them, mm -hmm. and there was that one soldier who got saved, I think, by Superboy. That mm -hmm. also Aqualad had thrown through the uh, through the portal to make sure that he was safe too. Yeah, that's that dude. Wow. I'm <laughs> glad you looped all that back. I'm glad we waited this song for that that brilliant callback. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here Thank for, you, everyone. <laughs> um, now that we know who Jason is, <laughs> um, Jade goes to interrogate both Onyx and Cassandra and she tries to use every league trick in the book to uncover to get things. Uh, she even asked Onyx, like, how do you know where the house is? And Onyx is like, well, Artemis, Artemis Croc took me three seconds on Google. Like, it, it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they just repeat their stories about why they left and why they're here. And Jade actually has no insights, no opinions, really has nothing to offer. And it's this moment where we turn to um, Orphan, who we learned also as a former League of Shadows that escaped the shadows for Batman. We don't know the context, but we know she's on Batman Incorporated and Orphan has some insight as well. But before we can hear or Orphan's insight, we get some information that a friend of ours is about to crash this party. So yeah, we do see that there is someone watching from the shadows. A shadow is watching from the shadows. <laughs> Uh, because Josh Keaton is here. J. Jonah Jameson is already gearing up. He's getting his high blood pressure medication because the menace has returned. Um, but before he swings in, uh, we do have to have to hop over to what's happening in the premiere building back in Hollywood one more time. Uh, Gar is still moping around. Um, he starts, he goes downstairs to watch TV on the big screen and immediately turns into a channel um, talking about how Brion of King Brion now is welcoming metahumans to Markovia. Um, this does seem to cause some discomfort for him because of everything that, that happened with Brion. But then they start talking about Perdita, and this is when Gar turns off the TV, heads back upstairs, and now that that scene is done, um, we find we see now that Black Spider has swung in alongside many, many of his uh, of his people, such as uh, Rictus. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Rictus is swinging in strong. Um, Rictus is one of a kind. Um, never heard of Rictus before today. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I see why. Um, Rictus is quite strong, has an earthquake arm, basically. Um, so <laughs> um, at, now they're trying to fight off Rictus 
um, Black Spider, and there's also Shade, who has uh, the power of shadows, uh, waiting in the shadows as well. And they're proving quite difficult for these non-metahumans, especially because, in Black Spider's words, he has hot, sticky web balls that he's just launching at all these heroines. Great. And we do get a cool moment where Cheshire, knowing that Black Spider can basically web up anything she uses, he webs a gun that she's holding, and she attaches a grenade to the side, which goes off right in Black Spider's face and knocks him off balance. Artemis also slices an arm off, Rictus's arm. Uh, I don't think she knew it was going to grow back, so I'm going <laughs> to just say, again, Artemis is out for blood today. But the fight suddenly stops when Lady Shiva arrives and takes Orphan hostage. And now this is when um, they do let through the rest of the other, the, capti- the captives here with Onyx and Cassandra as they have joined the fight. Um, but now that since this battle has ended, um, the call is for Orphan and Cassandra, sorry, Onyx and Cassandra to be passed over to the League of Shadows to face judgment. Otherwise, Orphan will die. They and it's like this typical bad guy rules. Don't bring your, your other members of your team. Don't involve any cops, that kind of thing. Um, though I would have to question what do cops do in this universe? Because I feel like I've never seen one. <laughs> Um, not anything, not anyone who's done anything useful. <laughs> uh, and with that, um, Shade uses his powers to vanish with uh, to vanish the entire team and transfer them around. Um, this is where now there's like a bunch of back and forth of what's going on. Tigress, Artemis, she is like, we gotta get our people back. That's the most important thing. We gotta get Orphan back. That's all that matters. And Cheshire wonders why because as she states why would we risk our lives and not bring your team for the daughter of lady shiva which is shocking news to everyone including artemis which means the batman and corporate needs to start sharing at least some secrets about their hr work (laughs) i'm just saying (laughs) Uh, uh, yeah this would be helpful things to know if one if you have someone who has a mom in league of assassins though given Batman doesn't know who where his son is. Uh, maybe he's not or the best. He has one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so maybe he's actually not the best person for this job. Um, <laughs> but they do decide that they're going to go through with this. Meanwhile, in a flashback. Um, oh, we should also mention that Lady Shiva, her daughter, Orphan, she, as a child, severed Orphan's vocal cords. Mm. So she'd mm. have to speak in just body language. And understandably, after hearing that, Cheshire's like, nope, not helping on this one. See ya. And dips. <laughs> and in a flashback, the close of the episode, Sportsmaster discovers that, that Artemis was sneaking food. Uh, Cheshire never returns to give Artemis some money to replace the food. Sportsmaster says, we're going to do some one-arm boxing tonight, and you're not going to eat, Artemis. And on that happy note, it's ready. we're ready for the lady and the ti- or the tigress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we open up to a distant world, uh, the world of Ma'ars, where Ma'ala Fa'ek is meeting with uh, his group. Uh, <clears throat> Makam X. Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh, my bad. <laughs> Makam X is meeting with his <laughs> <laughs> We will be liberated. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, we are on Ma'ars, where Ma- <laughs> Akam <laughs> is meeting with his group of followers, the Aasheds, and he assures them that even though the gene bomb failed, they succeeded in spreading terror among the Garoons and the Blood Ends. And speaking of spreading terror, Miss Marsha rolls through Super Saiyan mode. Honestly, this is at least Super Saiyan 4 because the hair Mm -hmm. was all the way spiked up and curling at this point. (laughs) And she's just knocking all the ah, Asheds left and right. Um, I think my favorite thing about this is that Martian Manhunter John is just in the background. He's just like, you know, I'm not even going to step into this. Why why should I even? I'm I'm here for moral support. I'm going to let her cook. I'm going to let her cook for a second. (laughs) Um, And after McGann steamrolls through the forces, 
Macom X is like, okay, look, 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 look. all right, chill, chill, sis. I don't even have kryptonite. Like, I don't even know where I get that. And of course, they assume that it's a lie, but no, it's true. They read his mind. They can't see any kryptonite. And again, hold, hold your eardrums because suddenly he uses a mother box to get away with the boom tube. And again, even Martian Manhunter is like, damn, that's loud. Jesus. <laughs> um, so it's a dead end for them because they ha- they still don't know how or who could be behind the, the kryptonite death of Superboy. And back on Earth, the trio of Artemis, Cassie, and or- <laughs> Orphan, Artemis, Cassandra, and Onyx are riding towards um, the League of Assassins. And, and <laughs> I just, this line of dialogue is incredible to me. They're like, oh, because Barbara's like, oh, I'd love to send the Bat family. But they're in the middle of a penguin two-faced turf war. How big are these people's gangs that they have Gotham in a war that needs the entire Bat family? What is this war? Can I see it? <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that there is a... I mean, there have been many times, honestly, where Two-Face or Penguin or Riddler and Joker have had Gotham City on lock with their wars. Um, I think my favorite one has to be definitely in uh, in Gotham. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this t- the television series, not just the actual place. <laughs> there, there's a lot of turf wars. I agree. I would love to see this play out. I want like a full story about this. I want to see the conversation between um, Penguin and Two Face, where Penguin's just going, nah. And Two Face is like, well, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> you could just say about my mom's. <laughs> so Artemis decides that instead of calling in the Bat family, um, she's going to do this mission alongside with Onyx and Cassandra. Um, Oracle is just like, I hope you're, you know, I hope you made the right decision. Meanwhile, we see that in Santa Prisca, Lady Shiva has Orphan chained in a cell. She tells her daughter about how disappointed she is and confused about her defection. You know, and you know that's real because she wasn't even like, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. That kind of statement. So you know <laughs> Cassandra messed up, I I guess. <laughs> um, especially because it seems to be such a simple mission. And then it turned into a mission that not only did she fail it, she turned against her own mother. And now we're sitting here like, what could this mission be? Was it to kill Batman? Was it to join in this turf war between Penguin and Two-Face and then, you know, destroy it all? No. Her mission, and she chose to accept it, was to kill the Joker for saying something bad about Vandal Savage. Look, why was she given an S tier mission for her <laughs> first assignment? It was like, okay, <laughs> sending her to kill Penguin or Two Face, doable. Mm-hmm. The Joker, my dudes, nah. what? <laughs> Not even Rage could do that. So <laughs> I don't know why. What she thought she was setting her own daughter up for failure here. Um. So as we're as we are learning that that was her mission, we cut away back to a conversation between Martian Manhunter and Hawkwoman, where they have checked the universe and all the kryptonite is accounted for, which I have way too many questions about to even talk about here. Yeah. <laughs> again, <I too>. it's <laughs> it's like you you guys can't know that, right? Um but we cut away from that. So the mystery is still a dead end of who could have brought the court tonight. And we see that um, the trio of heroines is swimming past landmines. At one point, they get a scratch on a, a rock that alerts a shark, prompting <laughs> Cassandra to have to punch out a shark. <laughs> this is a scene that happens. We're just reporting the facts here. Um, and it's not even King Shark. It's just a regular <laughs> shark. <laughs> just a, it's just a shark. Um, and we also get Artemis random narration. I mean, it is purposeful, but there's a lot of narration in this episode. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, it's um because during this entire time, just as the title of the episode states, she's reciting the story of the lady or the tigress and someone having to choose two different paths. Um, one, I, and we already know what's behind door A and door B, where one is the beautiful lady for this man to open up the door to, or one is the tiger where this man will be eaten alive. Um, so Artemis is equating her current scenario to the same thing, all while Oracle is using a cam camouflage mini drone to help give them a leg up on what to do next. And of course, um, during this time, Cassandra and Onyx are both kind of helping each other out, helping out Artemis. And the more that Barbara's watching this, she's like, you know, Tigress, I've been noticing that you definitely know when these threats are coming your way. Why aren't you doing anything about them? And or, um, she shares that, you know, it's because I want to see what either of them are going to do. It will help me make my decision. Um, now they rest up. They're getting ready for the next stage. And this is where we do see that um, they head on over to the actual grounds of where this cell, where Orphan might actually be. And as they're watching it, this is when um, Artemis reveals to their two or two um, now teammates here that she has a bit of help as we do see that this drone goes in and takes out the power of the entire building, allowing them to enter safely and uninterrupted. So again, uh, now we're cutting back to the Joker mission where we get a very a rare appearance from the Joker. He hasn't really been used in Young Justice all that much. Mm -hmm. um, and it's real that he sent a video to Ra's al Ghul complaining about the Injustice League because seasons ago it was revealed that the Injustice League was created for the Joker to lead as a distraction for a much bigger plan but Joker's salty about it he's so salty that he created bombs of Joker Venom and left them at the UN to blow up and ruin Raish's day his explanation for this takes a very long time even yeah. though look I would have accepted Joker got a joke. You know, I didn't need the whole explanation, but we got it um, in a very long monologue. And as he is still monologuing, most of the Bat family manages to disarm the UN bombs. Everybody's there. Multiple Robins, Batgirl, spoiler, Batwoman are all there to help. Um, and now we're in the flashback. Try to keep up. We did. <laughs> it's hard. But... Um, <laughs> Batman Inc. has completely disarmed all the bombs, and Joker runs in the most hilarious Joker run I've ever seen to try to get away. And before we see how this all ends, we cut back to the present time where Barbara is reminding everyone, Orphan is like a sister to me, something they have never established. Never. Um, and <laughs> you need to get in there and save her. So now they finally infiltrate the hideout to get Orphan back. But before they do, uh, we do have to hop on over to Ma'ars, where McGann is telling her parents goodbye. Um, her mother is urging her to stay with the family, but McGann says that she has responsibilities on Earth. But the more that McGann is pushing her away, the more that Ja'an realizes that her daughter isn't probably going to ever return. And McGann says that she's not planning on anything quite yet, but I can see why McGann wouldn't want to return because it's a home that not saying she abandoned in the past but she left in the past because of something that happened to her and now upon her return the the greatest loss she experienced happens again so you can see that like maybe she doesn't want to return however she does have something that she will um bring along with her as emory wants to join um on mcgann's journey because she's more concerned about her sister and her mental state at this point this this all happens very quickly. It's a nice little kind of connection into what happened in the previous episodes. But back on Santa Prisca, where the action is happening, <laughs> um, they're able to disable the 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 generators and everything as they enter. And as they're making their way through, um, this is when they're like, "All right, we're close by. This is the time to get whelmed, get trot, get turbed." And it seems that Onyx wants to get disturbed because she grabs her sword and aims it at Cassandra's neck. 
Yeah, Onyx was pretty much tired of this civil stuff. She really wants to just get down to business. And in a shocking reveal, she's flipped over and Cassandra rips off a glamour charm. So she has her full arm, her eyes not blinded, and she reveals, indeed, she is the mole. And the whole purpose was to get back to this base as it is. So as we're reeling over this reveal, we go back to the flashback where Orphan is in the UN trying to get the Joker and he tries to slash the Joker's, she tries to slash the Joker's back. And instead she slashes Barbara's back. And as Joker is laughing at this turn of events, the entire Bat family <laughs> gets a punch in, messes this man up like Powerpuff Girls on Mojo Jojo in jail. Look <laughs> it up. You won't. You will thank me later. And we look down at Barbara and it revealed that she is she has been severely hurt. And she t- turns to Orphan and says, look, I wasn't trying to save Joker. I was trying to save you from killing. And I, okay, out of everything, I know I've made a lot of knocks this episode, but I just kind of love how this casually surpassed the killing joke. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) In explaining how Barbara gets injured in the field, for her to make an active choice that does unfortunately lead to a severe injury, taking her out of active duty um, on the field, I do love how they did this. Um, I'll talk later about how this could have maybe worked a little bit better, but it is a good explanation for why things are the way they are. But now it's revealed that the reason all this mold business happened with Onyx and Orphan is for some data theft to steal some passwords. (laughs) All right, here we go now. We're going to take you all the way back to season one infiltrators episode <laughs> <laughs> so there was um some piece of nanotechnology that back in season one i believe actually was episode seven if i'm not mistaken <laughs> um where these little bugs were able to take down large corporations that had a lot of data servers because they were able to infiltrate in the smallest crevices steal the data break the whole building down and exit and not even leave a trace of anything. Um, Over the span of the 10 years that Young Justice has been operating, um, not in the outside world, but within their world, they were able to develop that technology even more to the point where they were able to turn the, um, turn the infiltrators, these little mosquitoes into somewhat of a semi-organic or organic life form. Um, it's still operated the same way like nanites. The thing is, though, that they have a smaller, a lower shelf life. So they, unfortunately, as soon as they, they don't have, they don't last forever the same as the others. So that is why in pre, in the scenes, we see that um, Cassandra actually had them in her body. Um, and upon getting knocked out during the earlier fight at the vault, um, she pretended to get hurt so that she could lie down next to the computer and have the infiltrators absorb the information and all the intel that's connected to the Justice League computers, take it back with her, and that's what sped up the uh, the timeline of um, uh, Lady Shiva trying to steal back um, Cassandra and all the information, because that way they were able to bring all the data back to the um to the league to the league of shadows headquarters so they can have all that information of the intel that the justice league has on them oh that was a lot <laughs> thank you thank you for explaining that um yeah. <laughs> because now you're gonna wonder okay they've stolen the data how is this gonna affect the rest of the show going forward what big scheme is this gonna come through how does this change everything the answers it doesn't. None of this matters because they instantly destroy the nanotech thanks to Barbara. So yeah. all of that explanation you just heard, pointless. pointless. Absolutely pointless. Yeah. So it was cool. It, sure, it was cool. <laughs> and it could have been really cool, but it doesn't matter. It's pointless. Yeah. <laughs> so now that the data death has failed, the shadows uh, with Shade, Rictus, Black Spider, Corner, Artemis, and Onyx 
and Orphan for that matter. And now that's the cliffhanger we leave going into I Know Why the Cage Cat Sings, which starts with a previously on <laughs> where we go back to season one where Artemis um, is talking to Cheshire and she has Cheshire dead to rights, but Cheshire reveals that, you know, it was a big reveal at the time that they were sisters. I don't know why we needed to be reminded of that since we are well aware. Yeah. I, sisters. No one no one ever forgot that. Like, why would Artemis be taking care of somebody and keep calling them their niece if she wasn't? Like, they didn't have, like come on, people. If we weren't reminded 50 times. Um, so while cornered, she was like, look, Artemis, I don't have any beef with you. Thanks for playing. You can leave. <laughs> Everybody else here, though, is staying. So, um... Bye. Kick some rocks. Um, <laughs> um, I'll make the rest examples of y'all, including Cheshire, who has shown up for backup. Uh, we did. Sorry, I did glance over that. Cheshire in the last episode did show up to back up her sister. Uh, but it is not really helping now because they're cornered. Um, and while we see how this is going to turn out, we have to cut over to Smallville. Yeah, so everybody tune in your, uh, what's it called? Three Doors Down? Somebody save me. <laughs> um because we are present at the Kent farm with Clark, uh, Martha Kent, Pa Kent, Lois, who looks very much like her DC animated movie universe counterpart. Uh, that that one was weird. Um, and finally, Johnny, the son of Clark and Lois here, um, who we've learned in the past that may be exhibiting some powers or not. We don't know. Um, so this is when Martha calls everyone for dinner. Uh, Clark is with Pa and they're just like we just gotta put the tractor down he's just casually holding this tractor one arm above his head and he's like just go put down some blocks and Martha Kent's like uh uh we know how this happens y'all keep talking <laughs> and then my chicken and corn and cornbread get cold so y'all gonna put this thing down and head on it <laughs> and you know what actually now the more I think about it Martha Kent is actually a uh, is is a, it might be a mom <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'd believe it mm-hmm in the middle of this, we hear that Jonathan is excited to see his Uncle Connor uh, because they usually would see him at dinner. And as they struggle how they're going to talk to him about this, um, we cut back to the League of Shadows where Barbara's like, look, I can get you out of this. I can help. Just got to keep him talking. And luckily, Artemis is extremely good at keeping them talking because we get a lot of talking here where... Cassandra was revealed. They weren't trying to plant a mole. They'd been there. They'd done that. They tried that. Didn't work twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this was trying to get Orphan back and trying to get Justice League intel. And they reveal Onyx was a distraction. They wanted Onyx to listen in on their plan in the hopes that they would find out that Onyx was disloyal to the League of Shadows and that her presence would cause enough confusion that they wouldn't question Cassandra when she came and showed up as a defector. So they were like, but if Onyx hadn't shown up, the plan would have worked anyway. This was just a bonus. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to, just trying to keep my head on straight here with all this. <laughs> um, and it was revealed that during the battle, they intentionally threw Cassandra into the computer so the nanites in her arms would interact with the computer and steal all the passwords and Batman's Netflix account. Again, all of this doesn't matter because the nanites are gone. And thankfully, this section finally ends when the lights go out. And despite the fact that they're trying to keep all of the people alive, the League of Shadows just starts blasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they did not care at all which is the worst thing um thankfully though for majority of them they do have infrared um so as everyone is battling it out we do see the scariest battle of all where orphan decides to take on lady shiva mm -mm. Mm -mm. and it's wild it's wild like you at this point we don't know what orphan has gone through she might be um, Mount. She might not have eaten in a while or something. Everybody else seems to be holding their own. Um, but then Cheshire yells out, yo, Orphan can't handle her mother. Somebody jump in. <laughs> and, 
And it's wild that Onyx even tries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, we know Lady Shiva is the one. But I also would be so upset if in the middle of a fight, someone called me out and was just like, yo, he can't handle that person. Somebody <laughs> else jumped in. I would have left. I would be like, y'all y'all figure this out. Like, I'm, I'm not going to get called out like this. Because remember, Lady Shiva was keeping up with Katana and Batman easily. Mm -hmm. So it is crazy for Onyx to think she even has a shot in hell here. Um, <laughs> and I, Onyx also tries to get Cassie. And then Orphan tries to go after Tectonic. Uh, with Tectonic? Tectonic? <laughs> that would be a better name. <laughs> I That's... So, yeah, Orphan tries to go after Rictus, another S-tier mission for her. <laughs> and at this point, I'm wondering, does anyone have a chance of making this out alive? <laughs> and so I will give quick credit. It is cool. Um, they use light and shadow really effectively in this battle. But once the lights do come on, um, to answer my question, they're pulled away by a shadow because shade helps them escape. Yeah, and it's it's a shocking revelation, um, much like the revelation that Johnny is about to get when Clark and Lois give him the explanation of death. This was this was a a tough one, um, because I will say this was also I felt like this was pretty good too. Mm. Um, in it, they basically explain that um, Connor is not going to be joining us for some chicken and cornbread, um, even though Wolf is here, as they usually come together. The main reason is is because Connor's body, um, there they explained it, and again Johnny is like I don't even know how he's like three <laughs> or two, but mm. I'm hoping he gets it. But basically, you say um, body works has different little parts of it that help it work together. When certain things stop working, then the body goes into like a forever sleep. Um, so even though Connor won't be able to join us physically, like we won't be able to play with him at the farm or anything anymore. We do know that Connor is always with us because he's always in our, in our minds, in our hearts. Um, this is nice. This is, I feel like this was a nice little beat to have because, um, you know, like we never got a chance to see about uh, the Kent farm and the family in this show really as much. I will say though, I kind of wish that this happened a little later in the season, maybe. Um I know mm. that at least it was like a month had passed at this point, but I feel like because the wound is still a little bit too fresh for people who are watching, it feels like it kind of like they're trying to close up something too quickly here on him. Um, so speaking of closing up, we're going to close up this battle with um Lady Shiva and the the team here because Shade is able to send the team to a beach on Santa Prisca, um, but Shiva is very upset about it, jumps through. Now, at this moment, there are two League of Shadow members who also jumped through this portal prior to Lady Shiva. And they're because Artemis got hit, uh, she tells them to throw the League of Shadow members back through the portal. And as they're being thrown back in, Lady Shiva comes out with a blade and slices them down because they're in her way. Again, Lady Shiva's that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not expecting that. Uh, this is I don't think this was TV 14 either because there was a lot of blood. Um, but as this battle is happening, uh, they're trying to get Artemis back over to the super cycle because, again, she's unfortunately received a wound on her leg. Um, at that same time, Lady Shiva's quite upset about the fact that Shade helped, and Shade reveals the reason why he helped is because Cheshire, he owed Cheshire a debt. So this was back in Triptych, where Cheshire was able to save him from the mind control thing. Um, so this is just him claim, just um, clearing the debt here. So he disappears right after he res he announces his resignation from this League of Shadows and that he's going freelance. And I gotta say, this was a cool exit. Cool exit. Yeah, I gotta... No wonder I didn't remember this deal because it was from Triptych. <laughs> um, so after exiting, uh, Shiva points out that, look, you can run away. That's fine. But the shadows are going to hunt you down forever. So uh, do with that what you will. But when she threatens to kill Barbara, that's where Orphan really gets wild. And she goes after her mom. 
And Cheshire is like, look, Artemis, you got to let her finish this one way or the other. So Orphan is able to fight her mom. And I don't think Shiva was trying her best because Orphan does get a killing blow. And her mom is starting to smile because she knows that this is it. This is the moment. But Orphan decides to spare her mother. And as in a really nice poetic moment, her mother is talking and and really ranting. But Orphan, I mean, we know she physically can't respond to her mom with any vocal calls. But the way she decides, it's still you still feel like this is a different kind of silence that Orphan is giving her, that she is really turning her back on her mom, rejecting her mom by not even entertaining her, not, not even with body language. So it is really, it's a really powerful moment of, with Orphan. And in this wild nature, we cut away from this and we get back to home where in the middle of all this, we should mention Artemis was stabbed in the leg. So now she's recovering from the leg stab um, don't worry, it's not going to factor into anything later. Um, <laughs> and Artemis decides, okay, Cheshire, you're home with me. Why don't you give, like, paying attention to your daughter a chance? So she calls Will and on FaceTime. And on FaceTime, Leanne comes into view and she says, I made a mommy mask. And walks in with a mask of Cheshire, which sends Cheshire running and gives me the question, what have they been telling this child? Yeah. <laughs> it's a very very good question like I don't think she remembers season 2 being in the back of like in that baby Bjorn on that mission with her mom because again she was like one so I don't know what happened there <laughs> um, so as she goes out running we do get a quick flashback as well where um, Artemis is um, this is again back at that sandbar cafe um, where she first encountered Cheshire and Cheshire was forced to disappear. Cheshire, we see that Cheshire actually goes to Sensei and tells Sensei that she's not going to recruit Artemis to join her in the shadows because Artemis is too weak because she let her live. Um, Sensei kind of tells her that, look, Artemis is still your family and you still got to recruit her. And at the same time, we see that like Artemis, who has joined the team at that point, is having this conversation for mom and tells this like talking for mom about that incident and shares that like Jade is just like their dad. But Paula shares that Artemis did the right thing by letting her go and that she understands where Jade is coming from because she spent many years trying to understand the losses that she made and the importance of family. So now that she knows that, she knows that um, she tells her daughter that the next time you see Jade, you have to convince her to stay. And you know, this leads into um, Artemis joining on this journey now to go and try to find her sister one last time. Um, but as she somehow, Ar um, Jade is able to get a helicopter from the house. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> but as this is happening, uh, we're back on the Kent farm where Clark Kent is having a conversation now with Lois, who has put Johnny to bed and they get real about what actually happened. They have a sit down of Superman is outside on his porch and he's crying, you know, just thinking of Superboy. And he he shares this regret that he didn't get there just two minutes earlier to save, to save Superboy. And Lois, you know, she's like, this may be cold, but let me remind you that if you would have been down there, you also would have died. Mm -hmm. Um. But Superman does ex express that, look, I wasted so much time wondering, oh, is this a brother? Is this a copy? And I should have spent more time with him, even though, again, Lois is trying to reassure him that you did. You did come around. He did know he was loved. Um, it's just unfortunate that, you know, this happened and that you you feel this way. So at, after leaving on this note, we it's revealed that Jade stole the helicopter to get back to Infinity Island because again she wants that smoke from Sensei, and basically she does want to die. She she doesn't see a way to go back to life as a normal person. This is her way out, and she also furthermore reveals that the reason she's not going back 
is because she didn't want her daughter to turn out like her. Which is really hard to track in this arc because that was not expressed at all. Yeah, she also connects <laughs> it with saying that like she's too much like their father too, which like she could have made the choice not to train her daughter. That, that's the way I see it. That's personally the way I see it. I think, and that 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 was weird for her to um say that she's. I get what she's saying that she's too much like their dad, but like besides the one mission that she brought her daughter on, she she never put her daughter in the firefight like at all. Maybe she should have just tried, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> like there, there really is a disconnect between um, Cheshire's words and actions here. And then pretty much out of nowhere, Onyx decides to drop her backstory where she reveals that she, her, that her, her grandpa was the amazing Bill Everett, the amazing man, mm -hmm. which I have to say, I've done a lot of DC stuff. I have no idea who this man is, where he's from. <laughs> I, I just know he was more Booker T than Malcolm X. <laughs> and the, I'm not making not, this not up. the wrestler though. Not not yeah. the wrestler. <laughs> I, there was a, I was confused at one point. <laughs> the iconic figures. Um so I'm not making this up when I'm saying uh she says the world would never recognize his worth because presumably he was black. I have to assume this because we don't even see a picture of this man. So Basically, upon recognizing nobody would mess around, would recognize her grandfather, Sensei came to her and essentially promised that they would work together and end racism. Yeah. I, I don't <laughs> if she joined the League of Shadows. I think we should join the League of Shadows. That's <laughs> what I'm just saying. <laughs> if they're working on it, the only people person who's really stopping them is Batman. So the way I see it now, Batman might be racist. I'm just... <laughs> Yeah, he's he's all against the League of Shadows, so sound like he racist to me. And to pull all of this back together, the sensei, he starts his speech saying, "Yep, we're all assholes, all right." Mm. My favorite I, moment out of that yeah, too. Please, was that, I, like... please take this from me. I, I don't know what to do with this whole scene. <laughs> so the other big part of this scene too is how Jade. And Onyx are both sharing how they decided to go along with the league because they saw a better family. And Sensei is just like, who told you this was a family? We trained you to be weapons. We did not have Sunday dinner. I don't understand why you saw us as a family. And then he says, well, I guess that must mean that our manipulation and mind warp had actually really worked if you were that devoted to our cause. So again, he shares that now we're doing the work to de, I guess, de violentize our like League of Shadow members who wish to do so. And we get this as a confirmation from the CEO of uh, the League of Shadows here, it's Rachel Ghoul, emerges out and again also backs up the claim that like we have never been a family, we have all been weapons. So let's train and talk about getting ourselves away from that because that is my goal now. And this is when he looks over to Artemis and tells her that, like, because as a common friend of ours will always say, she states, Rayshaw Ghoul is many things, but a liar he is not. So it's nice to see that um, Raish has decided to come full circle about this. However, it does get weird about this comment again, because this is when Raish says, looks over at Onyx and Jade, who both decide to stay there to meditate and calm their um, break out of their training of league as their league training by welcoming them both to his family, his true family, which I can understand now why Talia and Damien were looking up from the rafters and decided to walk away because it was like, what are we chop liver or something? Like we we legit your daughter and grandson. Like I don't understand. Um, but with that, we close with Artemis hugging Jade one, well, hopefully not one last time. But hugging Jade, letting her know that, like, I'll return and visit on the weekends because I know where Rachel Ghoul lives, um, you know, that visitation and whatnot. And they decide to head on back home. And we close our episode, our arc here, with a bunch of um, warm moments of montages as, like, 
on the Kent farm. Johnny is riding Wolf and um, everybody's looking happy because I guess this child forgot about death. Um, in Gotham City, Barbara and Orphan are just hugging each other because they finally, um, their sisterly bond has been reconnected. Um, in Raisha's Infinity Island here, Sensei is leading a meditation for Onyx, Jade, and um, Red, Red Hooded Ninja. <laughs> While um, Talia and Damon are, Damien are watching from the rafters one more time. And on Santa Prisca, uh, Cassandra Savage is having to tell her father about the fact that she failed the mission. While Lady Shiva has so many bandages on her that she looks like Usopp in the uh, the Water 7 arc. Um, sorry, I'm like catching up on one piece. Uh, yeah, hold it. <laughs> And we finally close out. Artemis is back home. She's with her family. She's with Will, Paula, Leanne, and Bruce Lee, the dog, in the kitchen. And she smiles one last time, hopefully to share that she has, if she hasn't overcome everything that has happened with Connor, at least she has closed a book, a chapter in her story about trying to save Jade, which has been a life mission of hers for quite some time. And with that, we close our set of episodes. Um, we do get one last scene where uh, in the after credits where Artemis is reciting um, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Well, a picture of her and Wally and Jade and Will and Leanne are all there together. So while we close on this sentimental moment and wonder who is Will Everett, <laughs> uh, we'll leave you with this podcast from the Forgotten Entertainment family that you should be listening to the next time you're not listening to us. Hey there, I'm Mr. Black. And I'm Mr. Green. And we're a couple of guys who met in a comic book store. Together we host the Pint O' Comics podcast, where we invite listeners to join us to talk about movies, TV, comics, music, or just whatever. We'll be joining up with the fine folks at Forgotten Entertainment, for a special limited series called On the QT, where we talk Tarantino. Every week for 10 weeks, a guest will join us to chat about every Quentin Tarantino movie from Reservoir Dogs to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So join us starting in May 2021. On the QT is available wherever you download your podcasts and is part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Ooh, that's a bingo. All right, now that we have... Our four episodes that pull together our Artemis arc. Out of the four, which one do you believe gets the Whelmed Award today? I, I was very close to, to going none mm. because I have a lot to say. So I'm going to go quickly and say, by the sheer value that it was the most entertaining, I'll give it to I Know Why the Cage Cat Sing. Mm-hmm. But this is not an this is not an honorable win by any means. It's just the most entertaining episode in this set for me personally, because it is so wild and off the wall uh, completely with the reveals, the backstories, the fight scenes. It it just felt the most together out of all these. But this whole arc, seeing it now side by side, is a complete mess. Um, A lot of the problems with this arc is they really are so eager to make this whole season a coherent product that the way they tried to do it in this arc was to keep reminding you that Superboy was dead. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at what the story of what this arc is trying to tell you, Superboy's death doesn't do anything to help it. There's a thin claim that Superboy's death made Artemis realize that she wants to reconnect with her sister. I am afraid I just don't buy it. I'm afraid that is not enough of a motivator for me to have her reconnect with her sister. Furthermore, because later on in that very same episode, the League of the Shadows attacks her house anyway, and she Mm. needs to go to her sister anyway for a completely separate reason that has nothing to do with Connor. I'm not quite sure why they even mention Connor's death at the beginning of this arc, except to tie it all together to um, to what's going on here. So I have too many RT alterations to count. So I'm going to say at a at a later time, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to work on re-piecing this arc together in a way that works. 
because there are things that work. I think the orphan backstory really works and was really effective. I think there was a attempt to connect orphans, bad family life with Artemis and Cheshire's. I think there's a way that works. Um, so I, I am going to be working to fi to fix this arc, <laughs> basically, and using the pieces they've given, rearrange it in a way that makes sense. Because, for example, the episode where Superman is grieving over Superboy mm -hmm. in this particular arc should probably happen at a time where Artemis is also grieving over Superboy, mm -hmm. just as an example. Um, so you maybe weld those two directly together so they feel coherent. But I'll tell you, as a hint, the the big alteration I would make right off the bat, Artemis would not know that Superboy died at all. Yeah. And this arc would be about them trying, her friends are trying to tell her about this. But she wouldn't know because she'd be too involved with everything that's going on with the League of Shadows, the threat to Leanne's life and everything. She'd be so embroiled in that that she doesn't have time to grieve that in more ways than one. Because like, honestly, she doesn't talk about it at all <laughs> in this entire arc anyway. So again, I will save all of the criticisms for a later date, but just know um, there's work to be done here. Um, how about you? <laughs> What's the most well for you? Uh, yeah, I agree. It is a bit um, there's a lot of it that I like as a whole, um, but there is some things that just need to be tightened up a little bit. But the episode that stood out for me, I think it was just really because I love the um, just hearing a bit more about like the League of Shadows and hearing about from the different perspectives of people who were a part of it. It's probably going to be Artemis through the looking glass. Um, you know, hearing I thought the the delivery of the scenes where it was just like Cheshire is talking with Onyx and sharing that, you know, I can tell that you're lying to me because every single part of your body, every response that you made, every way that you interacted with what I was saying was League of Shadows training. And then Onyx sharing that, look, she was a part of the League of Shadows since she was a kid. Um, it's the only way that she knows how to act. And I think at that part, nailed it for me because i was just like that's the kind of thing i want to hear because i never got that with like tara i never got that with we you know we have all these mm -hmm. kids who were part of the league of shadows and we have no idea how deep the mind control and the manipulation actually was and onyx was able to give us a real look into that and i think that that combination of the scene worked out really well i think that also in that episode we do find out about um, Cassandra Wusan and um, how she is the daughter of Lady Shiva I think that if you didn't know this already that would have been a great twist um, because it does work well together the fight scenes were enjoyable um, you know I Black Spider as you know there were definitely some questionable comments that were made from him as well as from Jade in that episode but I think it gave us like a to me it gave me a really good look of like what it was like what is it like for these this version of the uh of the team or at least these members of the team in this like non-meta human stance and also gave me the closest um story that i felt that really focused on artemis i think everything else was like how someone else influenced artemis but this one was just like really this is artemis this is how what her upbringing was like this is why she has this connection to jade Everything else was just like all the other episodes were just like this is a League of Shadows team fight. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't have Bowhunter security in the second episode, but it was still fun just to see that um, that first episode had it. But the second episode, I think, definitely connected more with Artemis. And I agree. I do think that Artemis, the motivation for Artemis doing this whole thing because of Connor does not make any sense because she was already doing that work personally. If anything, it just motivated her to take one extra step in work that she was already going to do when the other, um, I guess, comic champs corrections <laughs> that I kind of want to yeah. make is um, I agree. I wish that she didn't know. And I don't know how much, it, how much it is or how it works to animate fight scenes, but I kind of wish they just drew out more of the fight scenes. I think a lot of them ended somewhat quickly 
even though they mm-hmm. were long. I feel like if you just stretch that out a bit, show the full power of like the capabilities of these individuals in a more long out, drawn out fight scene, it would have done it would have done the work. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there was, you know, we did get some good action at the end of this, mm-hmm. but definitely there were a lot of uses of montages and cuts around the action. Even when the Bat family is disarming bombs, it's told mostly in stills. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot here. There are a lot of good pieces. There's so many good pieces. That's, but I'm definitely going to do a full redo later. But um, I do this think. Is, are we expecting yeah, this on um, unlicensed script surgery? It, we might require this. Uh, we might require <laughs> this. So look for that soon. But yeah, we're going to take another. I'm definitely going to take another run at this because I do like what the story was trying to do. I just think with a little rearranging, either, yes, either setting it before the events of Superboy, changing the arc, even, you know, once we've seen where the season goes and ends again, I think it'll be easier to see where this would, how to fix this a little bit. But yeah, for now, this was a tough block for me personally to sit <laughs> through, and it wasn't just because of all the narration. Oh <laughs> uh, well, expect some more because we have some comic book knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll be quick about this one, just because honestly, if we took the time to go through every single one of these characters, we will be here long enough for Young Justice to get the season five wish that we all want. <laughs> um. But I'll go over briefly some of the characters that we did get introduced to and also um, share some stuff that you can check out about them. Uh, so first up, we have Artemis. Artemis, really quickly, the things we want to check up about Artemis is this show. This not, <laughs> she's already a great character. She pops up. She doesn't pop up that often, uh, especially this version of her doesn't pop up that often in comic books. Um, but she has been influencing um like mainstream media and other forms of arts for a long period of time now. Like um, there is a random movie um, and this is like a deep cut here. I never watched the movie, but I saw a picture about it. There's like these two little British girls that were famous on Ellen. Um, <laughs> yeah. They had a movie and in that movie, one of the characters actually dresses up like Artemis to, and does like a bow and arrow routine and everything. Uh, Ellen, yeah. What's uh, what's this about? Yeah, you, you trying to make your an Artemis solo picture? <laughs> <laughs> One day, <laughs> but um, yeah. When that happens, um, they can also pull from um her most uh, probably her most accurate depiction from comics, uh, is Star Girl, the television series that was once on DC Universe, then put next day available for free on CW, and then just came a CW show. I didn't even know she shows up. Spoilers for season three, I guess. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, season two, actually. Um, because uh, Artemis was first introduced in Infinity Inc. number 34 in January of 1987. Uh, she was created by Roy and Dan Thomas, as well as Todd, Todd McFarlane. And very similar to her version of the character in the Stargirl series, she is the daughter of Tigress and, um, and Sportsmaster, just like we also have in our show here. However, she does lean into more of her villainous side um she her story starts out with like her help trying to help break her parents out of prison but she's able to do so and that is what causes her to get recruited into the injustice league or what is actually called injustice unlimited is the name of the team (laughs) which is um, infringement unlimited oh yeah (laughs) which is what led to her joining up with a bunch of other um individuals who were like the children of the villains of the injustice society so She's more so of a Justice Society of America villain, um, very much like how she is in the Stargirl television series. In that story, the biggest thing that came out of that story was that uh, she ends up marrying Icicle Jr. They end up getting pregnant. And Icicle Jr., who is afraid of the fact that she might die because his mother died in childbirth while giving birth to him, she's worried that he's worried the same thing will happen to her. He decides to steal this wand that allows people to become invulnerable. Um, but of course, the Justice Society wants to stop him. And what ends up happening is that our man takes a hit protecting Artemis and their and the unborn child. So later on, when Icicle Jr. decides to stop the fight because of the fact that this happening, 
our man goes back, steals the wand, and gives it to Artemis so that she can give birth to the child of her and Icicle Jr. Yeah, well, there's a fairly odd parent stroke in here. Yeah. Um, but... <laughs> um, we'll save that for another podcast because it's not talking about the birds and the bees on this one. Uh, what we will talk about, though, is another character who popped up uh, two years prior as we have Onyx Adams. Uh, she appeared first appeared in Detective Comics number 546 in January 1985. Joey Cavalieri and Jerome Moore are credited for her creation. And just like in our show today, she was a shadow that defected and then turned into a vigilante. Um, this was mainly because she felt that with time, she had too much blood on her hands. And the quote that she has is that, like, I've had so much blood on my hands that y'all y'all out here never had to fight for what I had to fight for or experience what I had to experience. And I know that I have this blood on my hands. So because I had to do it for money. So I want to get away from that now. Um, so she does take the time to get away from it by joining a monastery. Um, this is apparently the same monastery that Green Arrow was a part of during his training. And we know that she's a shadow because if you look into the comic books of Under the Red Hood, she is alongside Rachel Ghoul and Ubu as they are take trying to figure out what this whole situation is with Jason Todd, the Red Hood, and this battle that um he's causing within Gotham. And if you want to check out a more recent story of hers, uh, definitely check out War Games. Uh, this arc, basically, the plot line of it is that Stephanie Brown, a.k.a. Spoiler, who was a part of the Bat family, gets fired by Batman. And as a way to get back at him, she steals one of his, some information that he has about the individual and uses this person to set up um, to become the number one crime boss in Gotham. And that person is Matches Malone. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, this causes an actual war because she does not know that Matches alone, Malone and Bruce Wayne are one and the same person. Does he do the crimes to, mm. like, keep up the... <laughs> she builds a facade. She just creates this, like, random... She creates this identity that someone else is doing all this work, and they all believe Matches Malone is the one responsible. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next up, we got Cheshire. Um, real quick about her. She's a create. She's created by Teen Titans creators Marv Wolfman and the late George Perez. She's always been the villain, the rival of the Teen Titans um, since her introduction in New Teen Titans Annual Number 2 in 1983. And Young Justice is already getting her story right. She's fighting against y younger heroes. She ends up having a kid with um, Roy Harper and Leanne. We know already know all about that story about them. Uh... Next up, we got Lady Shiva, and we talked about Lady Shiva in the past, um, so I'm not going to talk about her again, mainly because, well, one thing to be honest about, it probably wasn't the most in-depth collection of her stories because of the fact that she was sharing the room with five other individuals, and unfortunately, she's experiencing the same thing today, so I don't want to just take that away from her again. However, what I will share is that um, I do want to give a shout out to this one person who reached out to us, uh, so thank you to... Twitter or X user, whichever the platform is now called, mm -hmm. um, at Talking Lady Shiva, who reached out to us after hearing our Soul the Dragon episode and shared a thread um, that they created with some of the with some of Shiva's biggest appearances between her creation um, in 1975 all the way up to her comic books appearances until two, um, 2022. So we'll add that thread, um, the link to that thread in the note in our description of this episode. And we really encourage you all to just check it out um, check out the list, check out the reading, especially if you are um, making your way to a comic book store, if you have DC Universe. Um, you know, there's a lot of great stories out there about Lady Shiva and glad to see that like in like today's episode and also in um, Soul of the Dragon that she's getting some more time to shine. <laughs> Just those two, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, those, those two, unfortunately. Um, and last but not least, the question we've all had on our minds. Who in Sam Hill is the Amazing Man? <laughs> so the Amazing Man is one of four individuals. However, the first one was Will Everett, who was first who first debuted in All Star Squadron number twenty three back in July of nineteen eighty three, and was created by Roy Thomas and Jerry Ordway. 
Uh, Will Everett, he was, this is going to sound, probably sound a little similar to other characters. He was a promising young Black Olympian who had competed in the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin. Of course. <laughs> Mr. But, Lightning. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> but his career devolved into him having to take a janitorial profession at a la- laboratory. And during an incident that happened there, an explosion gave him the abilities to basically mimic whatever properties he touched. It's pretty useful. Yeah. Uh, it is said to be that he is the answer to Marvel Comics' Absorbing Man. Mm. So he was able to touch steel, turn his body to steel. So Will Everett um, joined the team, and much like another uh, World War II character who was forgotten to time because he was black <laughs> Isaiah Bradley <laughs> uh, we have the amazing man who was a World War II vigilante and going out there and giving the right hook to those who deserved it because he was able to absorb and turn his body into different things okay sounds like he had potential why has nobody heard of him <laughs> well because unfortunately comics um with time with different uh crisis moments again this was the first one by the second one fortunately we'll say there since there have been four of them three the first three have all been um african-american individuals uh the fourth one now currently is not but they've all adopted the name the amazing man and unfortunately it's just one of those cases where it's just like due to time maybe poor comic sales or due to crisis events they just died or erased from the timeline and newer versions of their character was probably created. Um, but Or, again, comic book sales, there was no place for him to actually fit in the universe. So that's why The Amazing Man, unfortunately, is not a part of our mainstream comic book set. Yeah. Not so amazing. Sorry, man. Yeah. Well, that's it. Now that you learned a little bit more about Will Everett, The Amazing Man... Um, Again, check out all these comics because uh, it will be helpful in just in these lists because it will be helpful to um, give these characters their moments to shine, especially because, you know, for people who like a completed run or some things, or sometimes this is the perfect kind of characters to look into about those kind of um, things. Um, so we're just going to wrap our episode here. Uh, come back and join us next week as we focus on some magic hoodoo that they do in the DC universe as we're focusing on Satana. Uh, be sure to check us out on our socials and our Patreon for more content. And remember to take care of yourself. And most importantly, if you have to run away because you just don't want to be somewhere, find a way to have a helicopter on deck. I, I don't know how Jay did it, but I feel like it must be possible regardless of your income or your connections. And if you join the League of Shadows, you might end racism. So, you know, think about it. <laughs> It's a chance. That's what they're promising. <laughs> Macom X is their number one person. Like, you know, <laughs> they'd be too powerful. <laughs> <laughs>